nuclear fission is the basis for nuclear weapons. It is also the basis for nuclear power. But what is nuclear fission? To understand, let's start by looking at the nucleus. You probably are familiar with the model of the atom devised by Niels Bohr. In this model, the center of an atom is positively charged. The nucleus is surrounded by a cloud of electrons with a negative charge. Electrons are important in understanding chemical reactions, but for nuclear reactions such as fission, we can ignore them and focus on the nucleus. The nucleus contains most of the mass of an atom, but is a tiny fraction of the volume. The nucleus is made of individual particles called protons and neutrons. Protons have a positive charge, and neutrons have no charge at all. To understand the energy released by nuclear fission in bombs and power plants, we must look at the two different types of forces at work in the nucleus. The first is electrostatic force. Just like with magnets, two identically charged particles will repel each other, while opposite charges will attract. So what causes a nucleus full of positively charged protons to stay together? The answer is the second major force called the strong nuclear force, or strong interaction. It works to pull all particles tightly together regardless of their charge. This is the most powerful force known in nature, but it only acts at extremely close distances. Electrostatic force works over longer distances, but it is much weaker. Because the particles in the nucleus are very close together, the strong nuclear force dominates. This is what creates the binding energy of the nucleus that keeps it together. The binding energy for different nuclei is not the same. That is shown in a very important curve called the curve of nuclear binding energy. On the bottom is the total number of nuclear particles, also referred to as nucleons, in each nucleus. On the left side is the average binding energy per each nucleon in units of MeV, or million electron volts. The MeV represents the amount of energy needed to break up the nucleus and free each particle from the binding grip of the strong nuclear force. At first, as you move from the lighter elements like hydrogen on the left, you can see that the average binding energy increases as more and more nucleons interact with each other using the strong nuclear force. More nuclear binding energy leads to a more stable nucleus, so stability increases as we go up the scale. This trend eventually peaks with iron, which is the most stable element, and begins to decline gradually with heavier elements. Another way to think about this graph is that it shows the relative stability of different nuclei. This curve of nuclear binding energy is the key to understanding nuclear energy and the basis for the incredible power of nuclear weapons. Let's start by looking at the left side of the curve, at the lighter elements. What would happen if you combine the nuclei of two light elements? Because the number of protons determines the type of element, increasing the number of protons in the nucleus will yield a new, heavier element. This is called nuclear fusion. This is the basis for the energy of the stars and the hydrogen bomb. Now, look at the right side of the curve of nuclear binding energy. Once we get beyond iron, the stability of the nuclei begins to decline again. Why? As the nuclei become bigger and bigger, the nucleons become further apart from each other. Remember, the nucleus is held together by the strong nuclear force, which only acts at very close distances. So these bigger nuclei are starting to lose some of that force, while the electrostatic forces continue to fight against it, destabilizing the nucleus. If we combine the nuclei by fusion of these heavier elements, the product would be even less stable than the original. However, what if we split a heavier nucleus into two smaller nuclei? This is called nuclear fission, or splitting the atom. We've created two new smaller atoms from the original one. On the curve of binding energy, fission causes a move from the less stable heavy elements to elements in the more stable center. By convention, the curve of binding energy is shown as positive MeV values. In reality, it might make more sense to show an inverted curve with MeV in negative numbers. This would show that the more stable elements are in a potential energy well. Any change that moves from a less stable nucleus on the edges to a more stable nucleus nearer the well in the middle will result in a release of energy. When a nucleus of uranium-235, which has an average binding energy of 7.6 MeV per nucleon, splits into two smaller products with average energies of about 8.5 MeV per nucleon, that causes a release of 0.9 MeV per nucleon, or a total of 192 MeV per fission event. 
In the 1930s, scientists discovered that they could cause fission of uranium by bombarding it with free neutrons. They very quickly recognized that there were three critical characteristics of nuclear fission that meant you could harness that energy in an awful, destructive way to make an atomic bomb. The first characteristic is that the sheer amount of energy released in a fission reaction is hundreds of millions of times more energy per atom than a chemical reaction. It's hard to imagine what that number means. Let's say this is what a kilogram of chemical explosives can do. Now, here is what an explosion from a kilogram of fissile material looks like. The second important characteristic of nuclear fission is the speed with which nuclear reactions occur. Fission reactions are very, very fast reactions, about 10,000 times faster than chemical reactions. So this means not only are you making a lot more energy, you're making it much more quickly. But there's a third characteristic that turns out to be just as important as the previous two. It was found that only a very small number of elements on the periodic table can easily facilitate a fissile reaction. All it takes is adding an extra neutron to the nucleus. These elements are called fissile materials. Why are fissile materials important? Because when a fissile nucleus breaks apart, not only does it produce two new smaller nuclei, it also sheds a couple of stray neutrons. If those neutrons find another atom of the same material nearby, they will be absorbed by the nucleus of that atom, causing it to split apart, releasing more energy and stray neutrons. This phenomenon is called a chain reaction. These three factors make the atomic bomb possible. When you fission a nucleus, you get huge amounts of energy released. It is released very rapidly, and by using fissile elements, the process can keep self-perpetuating once it's started. So which elements are usable fissile elements? There are only a few. One is uranium-235, and another is plutonium-239. Uranium is a naturally occurring element, most uranium exists as the relatively stable isotope uranium-238, but about 1% is uranium-235. Uranium-238 is stable, but uranium-235 is both radioactive and fissile. When it is hit by a neutron, it will briefly become uranium-236, which is highly unstable and will immediately split into two new elements, such as krypton-92 and barium-141, releasing three additional neutrons along the way. The three additional neutrons released during the split can go on to split other nearby U-235 nuclei, initiating a chain reaction. What about plutonium? Plutonium is not a naturally occurring element. Plutonium has to be grown in a nuclear reactor. It is even more fissile than U-235, and the fissile reaction proceeds faster. When it fissions, it also produces multiple daughter products, including the highly radioactive strontium-90. But if fissile materials can fission and create chain reactions, why don't they just spontaneously explode? A chain reaction will only occur if there is a critical mass of fissile material, which happens when the chance of the stray neutrons hitting something fissile is greater than the chance of them escaping or being absorbed by a non-fissile material. In nuclear power plants, critical mass is avoided by using smaller amounts of fissile material and including control rods to absorb some fraction of the stray neutrons. This allows a controlled release of energy. In a nuclear weapon, there are two ways to achieve a critical mass. For U-235, two non-critical masses are shot together rapidly to create a critical mass. For plutonium, the fissile material is rapidly compressed with a controlled implosion, bringing the nuclei closer together. Both methods lead to a critical mass of fissile material. This causes an extremely rapid chain reaction and the release of the unimaginable quantities of energy we know as an atomic bomb.